You may already be familiar with the idea that when a polynomial has real coefficients, such as t squared minus 4t plus 5, that its roots will have a relationship between them necessarily by virtue of the fact that the roots are found in an extension of the real numbers, namely the complex numbers in general, and that that extension has an automorphism over the real numbers that's non-trivial. What does all of that mean? It means in the case of polynomials with real coefficients that their roots come in pairs that are conjugate one to another. This particular polynomial has roots of 2 plus i and 2 minus i, and those are just complex conjugates one of another. The roots exist in this pair precisely because the complex numbers are just the extension of the reals by i, and there is an automorphism of c over r that sends i to minus i. In fact, we've shown that it's the only non-trivial automorphism of the complex numbers over the reals. We seek a generalization of that idea. That if I have a polynomial with coefficients in some base field, and its roots lie in some extended field, that an automorphism of that extended field over the base field is just going to relate those roots one to another in some fashion. And that's a key observation for us, because it's how we're going to use automorphisms to understand the roots, the nature, the number, and the relationship between the roots of a polynomial. So we're going to see this as a generalization of the conjugate roots theorem, just replacing the word conjugate by conjugate under an automorphism. And the statement is that when I apply an automorphism of a field over f, that that automorphism is going to send roots of a polynomial over f to other roots of that polynomial over f, as a generalization of the way that in the complex numbers, roots come in conjugate pairs if the polynomial had real coefficients. So the statement is, if E is an algebraic extension of f, and P is a polynomial over f, then if x is any root of p, then phi of x will also be a root of p for any phi which is an automorphism of E over f. In other words, any phi which is an element of the Galois group of E over f. So I don't want to prove this in general, but this example should illustrate how the proof works. Let's take some nasty looking algebraic number, like 7 minus the cube root of 10 minus radical 5. We'll call this alpha. Now we can use technology, for example, to find a minimal polynomial for alpha over q. It turns out to be a sixth order polynomial. It looks like this. So this is the minimal polynomial for alpha over the rationals. Now my question is, what other roots will this polynomial have? And we might just take the guess that if I take alpha and I just rewrite it and flip one of those signs from a minus to a plus, for example, if I switch the square root of 5 from being subtracted from 10 to being added to 10, I might ask the question, is beta also a root of this minimal polynomial? Well, it will be if there exists some automorphism over q that sends alpha to beta. Is that true? Well, let's think about what field alpha lies in, specifically what extension of the rationals will this number alpha reside in. So if I take the rationals, the first thing I might do is extend the rationals by the square root of 5. That's a quadratic extension, therefore it's a normal extension, and therefore it has a non-trivial automorphism that sends radical 5 to minus radical 5. That appears to be exactly the automorphism that we want to relate this alpha to this beta. So that phi is an automorphism of q adjoined radical 5 over q because trading radical 5 and minus radical 5 is going to leave all the rational numbers alone. But then alpha doesn't really live in this extended field. It actually lives in a bigger extended field, maybe radical 5 and the cube root of 10 minus the radical 5. But if phi is an automorphism of q adjoined radical 5, which is a subfield of E, then it also extends to an automorphism of E itself. So we're going to think of phi as not being an automorphism that just trades the square root of 5 for the minus the square root of 5, but it actually is an automorphism of this whole extended field that happens to do just that. And so this realizes beta as the image under an automorphism over q of alpha. Now, why is the conjugate roots theorem true? Why is it true that if alpha satisfies this polynomial equation, that phi of alpha must also satisfy this polynomial equation if phi is an automorphism over q. Well, all we have to do is take this polynomial equation, which we've written down here, and just apply the automorphism phi to both sides of this equation. So I'm just going to slap a phi on this. Now, this is going to be a true statement, but we want to know why putting a phi on both sides is going to give us an equation that has to do with beta, the image of alpha. 
And here's where we use the fact that phi is an automorphism. Therefore, it respects addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. So instead of taking phi of the whole thing, I can take phi of each individual piece, and that breaks apart over factors as well. So phi of alpha to the sixth, for example, is the same as phi of alpha raised to the sixth, and so on and so forth. So phi really applies to each individual piece of this expression. That's what's great about the algebraic structure of an automorphism, in particular, a homomorphism of fields. But we know something more. We know also that phi is an automorphism over q. So when I apply phi to each of these coefficients in the polynomial, I'm going to be just the identity. In other words, when phi acts on those rational numbers, it leaves them alone. So phi of 42, for example, is going to be 42. Phi of 735 is 735, and so on and so on. So phi is not going to change the coefficients of this polynomial at all. And so when the dust settles, we have the same polynomial equation written again, just in place of the alphas, we have phi of alphas. And because we're calling phi of alpha beta, that implies that beta is a root of the same polynomial equation that alpha was a root of. So the statement of the conjugate roots theorem is that an automorphism always sends a root to a root. The image of a root of any polynomial over f under an automorphism of e over f will itself be a root of that same polynomial over f. So automorphisms send roots to roots. This is a key observation for us for the semester. The wrinkle, though, is that not every pair of roots of a polynomial are connected by some automorphism. In the next video, we want to begin to sort that difference out. That automorphisms always send roots to roots, but they don't necessarily send every root to every other root. And it's a measurement of just how much that is true or false that tells us how complex a polynomial is, how much we have to add into the rationals before we split a polynomial.